All right. And I am going to call the August 17th meeting of the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee to order at 9.02. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public are able to access the meeting in real time via Zoom or by telephone. And now I'm just gonna take a moment to make sure everybody can be heard and can hear. And I'll start with you, Mandy. Present. Nika. Present. Welcome back. Thank Glad you. you're here. <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Present. And Pat. Present. Okay, that was in no particular order and you can hear me as well. Um, and so we, are going to begin today's meeting by uh, reviewing the bylaws that we have to review. And then I've asked Pamela and Jennifer if they're able to join us. I, I gave them 9.30, said it would likely be 9.45, but we'll see how quickly we'll move through these. Um, so, and I also wanted to make a note about the packet. So Athena, um, had to have everything in the packet by last Thursday because she was going to be away this week. And so there may be some items that aren't in the public packet yet that will be added after the meeting. Those two items, actually, it's only one item. Um, it's a message that I got from Guilford Mooring. Um, it's in our packet now, but it won't be in the public packet. So when it's being referred to, if anybody is listening, um, which we don't have any attendees, but I like to pretend sometimes, um, <laughs> then that that they can look at, you'll be able to look at that when, when Athena gets back uh, in the packet. So um, Mandy, do you wanna start with bringing back uh, the soliciting? Sorry, I'm trying to do too many things. Yes, let me find, let me get my program working to pull yeah. that up. Yeah, take your time. So while Mandy's doing that, I'll just review that today we'll be reviewing bylaw 3.39, street numbering of houses. We'll be coming back to bylaw 3.36, soliciting. Uh, we'll also be reviewing bylaw 3.4, snow and ice, and we'll be returning to bylaw 3.4, 2-2 discharging of firearms um, with additional information from Chief Livingstone. And then once we've completed the review of those <clears throat> items, we'll move on to our equity lens review discussion. Sorry about that. Okay, take your time. <laughs> Why? My computer is basically freezing. So let me see if I can get this open somewhere else. Um, do you want me to? I don't, I could also do it, Mandy. I, I've now got it pulled up in a different um, window. Okay. It just took a while. Um, so. And um, Anika, just so you know, um, this is uh, a bylaw that was that Mandy had asked for some changes on at a town council meeting that I both, I believe both you and I missed. Um, it came to GOL as a referral, and then we identified, we had some questions last time that needed to be uh, worked out. And so now Mandy's bringing it back today uh, to discuss it. And if you have any questions about it along the way, because I know I did, please just let us know. So so what is on the screen is solely the parts that I asked to change. Um, this is a long time in coming in terms of a request um, from, I received a request a while ago from the Board of License Commissioners, or at least the former chair, who's now the vice chair. Um, to remove the actual fee numbers from bylaws and give the fee setting authority to an appropriate place, mainly the Board of License Commissioners. There were two bylaws currently that set the fees in the bylaw. Um, and you can see that one for soliciting the fee was set as $10. Well, if it's in a bylaw, it's much harder to change than if you just give the authority to another entity. 
um, within the bylaw. And so um, the question last meeting was soliciting the, the fee for the um, permit or registration is actually, um, the registration is actually done by the police department. The registration certificate is issued by the police department. So GOL had questions as to, is the board the appropriate place to be setting the fee or does the police or should the police department be setting the fee? Um, and so I went to the chief and I asked him that question <laughs> and said, do you want to set the fee or um, are you OK with the board setting the fee? And the chief basically came back and said, the board is fine. I don't care. And if it's me, it's never changing, basically. He's, he's a softy. Because <laughs> he's a softy. Um, and then I attended the Board of Licensed Commissioners meeting the next day where they were talking about both of these. And they had, I told them what the chief had said. Um, they had no problem with either of these. This is one of two. The first reading for the second one was Monday night. But um, the board didn't take a formal vote on their opinions on whether they should set these fees. But what they did do was actually vote the fees pending change in the bylaw by the council. So I took that to mean they're perfectly fine with having that authority, even though they didn't vote to say, you know, to formally tell the council, hey, we're okay with this. Um, so that's the status of this one. Great. And so what you're looking for now is um, a recommendation from us that this as it stands, although, well, we want, so we're going to, does this, this is how it stands right now, right? What would, or we're going to change the non, no, what are we doing here? So, Hold on. so the red is what would be deleted or added. Um, and, and GOL is tasked with clarity, consistency, and actionability, but also recommendation on the substance for these. Okay. Yeah, so instead of saying resident fee, $10 for annual registration, non-resident fee, $5 for a 60-day registration, all of that would be deleted and it would say fee, the Board of Licensed Commissioners shall, sh shall, shall set the annual registration fee for soliciting in accordance with MGL Chapter 40, Section 22F. Okay. And um, Mandy, the question on, um, there have been so many bylaws we've been discussing, my brain is, um, but the question on whether this was okay through KP law, which I haven't, so how do we want to think about so that? That is a, you know, when the bylaw review committee reviewed the bylaws, they had a question about this in general, and particularly as it relates to, I think, um, nonprofits or political campaigns or something. Um, this does not deal with that, but that question was, hey, if we're going to modify those things, maybe we should see from KP law whether what what the legalities of it all are. Um, with respect to MGL, right? Like, yeah. Uh, okay. I see um, Anika's hand, so let's go to Anika and then come back. So I did have a chance to read this and, and the softy comment. Um, so, but my question was, this seemed fairly uh, cut and dry. So I was wondering, you know, it's not, were there any um, objections to it at all? Or was it just a matter of uh, getting clarity? You know, so the board had no objections to taking over the authority. Um, the police department, uh, the chief had no objections to giving the board the fee setting authority. This does not change who enforces the bylaw. It just changes who can set the fee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to make it clear, this was helpful for me, Anika, to know that this and one other bylaw were two of all of the bylaws where the fee was set within the bylaw as opposed to, is that right, Mandy, as opposed yeah. to being... So Mandy's objective was to bring all of the bylaws into accordance with one another and have a sort of standard way of doing things. Yeah, 3.8 was the other one. We had the first reading on that on Monday. And uh, there's five or six in the bylaws themselves where the bylaw gives the authority to the town council, the board of license commissioners, the town clerk, um, 
I think the health department has some of them, it, but these are the only two that set it within the bylaws still. And so it was a goal to be consistent that any fees are set outside of the bylaws and the bylaws just give the authority to the appropriate committee or person. Jennifer? Um, yeah, so maybe just to put a conversation for another time, but it came up um, during the waste hauler bylaw discussion on Monday, you know, somebody asked why is the our police officers doing this enforcement? So I don't know if that's a, it has to be there by state law or, you know, since we want to move away from bringing the police into non-criminal activities, um, is, you know, is that something we might want to consider? I don't know. I, I suppose you're not, you can't put enforcement well, we don't want Crest to do this. I, I just is so. I guess my question is: Is does that have to be there? Is that a state requirement? I mean, we wouldn't use our police officers to go collect the fine if it wasn't paid. That's how I read that. May I? Of course, go ahead, Mandy. Yeah. Oh, Pat, you can answer if you want. No, that's okay. Go ahead. So this has both a criminal and a non-criminal. Criminal enforcement can only be by police officers. So right. if you want criminal enforcement. That's there. And so if you want only criminal enforcement, it's just the police, right? Um, but if you want an option for a civil fine, you have to identify who would write that ticket. Um, and, you know, there might be differences of opinion, but I always think that if you have a criminal fine and a non-criminal fine, at a minimum, you want the police to also be able to do the non-criminal fine so that they don't have to, if they need to write a ticket, have to do it criminally. Because if they're not listed under the non-criminal, they can only write a criminal ticket. They can't okay, write so the non-criminal. So, so if we didn't want a criminal enforcement, you, we could potentially say delete criminal enforcement completely and then choose someone else for non-criminal. But if you're going to leave criminal in, in some sense, to me at least, it makes sense to leave police officers as the non-criminal so that they have that choice. Okay, so I'm being really, I was being too literal because I didn't understand that. So we're talking about writing the ticket. We're not talking yes. about going and knocking on the door saying you're late with your payment. No, this is yeah. the writing okay. of the ticket. And that was the same with the waste hauler. Right. You know, we weren't talking about the police coming out. We were saying if, if you violate it, oh, I see, the police will issue the citation. Got it. Thank you. But I, I do still think it's a fair point to consider because even if it is writing a ticket, I mean, we're talking about limiting interaction between the police and the residents, if not needed. Um, and I think that whether it's writing a ticket, we know that things can, you know, escalate or change or whatever. And that's that's no disrespect to our police department or anyone, but just to say that, you know, I think if if the goal is, and I am feeling as I'm looking at the bylaws more and more that they all need to be reviewed um, in terms of this now that we're moving in a direction of alternate policing uh, services and that we have some goals around this. Um, so I'm curious what the committee feels because I, I don't feel like the question um, about whether this is in uh, accordance with MGL has been answered necessarily. Um, and I also am feeling um, like we need to review these for the criminal enforcement piece, whether we want the police to be involved in this. So Mandy, do you see a situation where we can recommend this as you've, you know, as we're laying it out here, but then bring it back at a later time for additional review on those other matters? Um so I'd like to hear from Pat before I answer that. Okay. Yeah, Pat. One of the things that's true is that this is about not necessarily re residents who are coming in soliciting, but people who are coming in knocking on doors that have been identified as elderly. I'm just using that as an example. And they are doing scamming. So there is a criminal element. But one of the things that we could do, because Cress is going to be able, and I want to check this, Press is going to be able to uh, give tickets. Is that correct? Only, In if, we, only if we list them under non-criminal disposition. Right. And so one of the things that we might be able to do to simplify this is say in, enforcement by community safety officers. 
because then it covers both crests and it uh, covers um, so we, or not. Yeah. Yeah. the other thing is there are you know yes anything can escalate but there's no guarantee with crests that things aren't going to escalate they just don't carry guns and we haven't had that as an issue so I think um, I think we can be overly cautious Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I saw an, Anika's hand go up. Mandy, do you want to hold off on a response to that until can yeah, Anika? That's fine. Okay. Anika. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand. I could be, I think I've I've gone off track here. Uh, or my mind has anyway. Mm -hmm. Um so if this is soliciting and um it's disregard my story if it's way off track, but if I am knocking on a door and I shouldn't be, right? And the police come, right? Or is this, you know, how it works to, to issue a ticket to find something to me. And they find that what I'm doing is not criminal. Am I to wait while a press officer is called in? Would I, am I held? How do they do that? I mean, or am I just really misunderstanding how um, the difference would be in how, what would you do if, let's just say you, um, the police come and it is not a criminal issue, how then and when does Crest become involved? If it's, go ahead, Pat. If it's a non-criminal issue, if, you know, whatever, then the police would say, okay, see you later. I mean, uh, if Crest is, if it goes to dispatch, Mm -hmm. Dispatch is making the determination about whether to call the police or to call Cress. So uh, if a Cress person came and there's no nothing terrible going on, oh, I thought I could do this, I'll go get the license, say bye-bye, see you later. There's There would be no fine, no uh, criminal or non-criminal necessarily. So if there's a misunderstanding and I don't mean to get too far into the weeds about this, but if there's a misunderstanding and it's Cress and they need the police, it would just, they would Cress have to be like, okay, this is criminal, we're not authorized, so you can go? Or we have to wait because this is criminal and we have to wait for the police and do they have the authority to do that? I'm just generally questioning, like it, it seems like it would make sense if it's the dispatch, if they understand and they know who to, um, who to send out. Um, I'm just questioning whether are we opening another can of, can of worms um, with that transition if the call is misunderstood. I think um, we, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I just yeah. went. I think we should look at MGL 40 section 22 F. I, I think to me, this is raising a larger question again of what bylaws are using the police for both criminal and non-criminal and whether that those bylaws need to be updated based on a new lens that we're using. And I, so what I would ask for is um, someone who has more experience like Pat or Mandy to share how we might request a, a, a broader review um, right. happen that's specific to this lens that we're um, right, and this appears in many a number of bylaws. Right. Yeah, Instead of doing it bylaw by bylaw, do it as yeah, just one. We're doing a uniform look at everything for criminal and non-criminal where the police is listed, and who do we need to bring into that conversation? Mandy, please. So. Oh. MGL chapter 40, section 22F is completely different from a fine. So that section, we're talking about two different things. MGL chapter 40, section 22F is who has the authority to set a fee to issue a license, not who has the authority to issue a fine or a ticket when something has been violated. They're two different things. Um, so the proposal I've, that, that, this came to the GOL originally on is who has the authority to set a fee to issue a license or a registration or a permit. What the conversation has moved to is who should enforce any violations, so any failure to get that license to, to register, who has the ability to enforce it. Um, I agree absolutely that it might need to be a 
larger conversation and we shouldn't do it in one at a time, but I would caution us. Um, our Crest director, when directly asked at Monday's meeting by me about his thoughts on Crest being able to issue tickets, and should we be looking at bylaws to give Crest the authority to issue tickets, as in potentially this case, his response was, we don't want that authority because we don't want to be seen as someone who issues tickets. We want a more congenial relationship. And so I caution us as GOL from going in and saying, or as a council and saying, well, we don't want the police doing it, so let's just give it to Cress, where that might actually be against what our Cress director really wants, even if we want to see it not by the police. So I think in some sense, some of the questions that could be going on later are failure to register. Should there be a fine? Do we even need the bylaw then? As Pat said, sometimes they are used, these solicitors are used to actually scam. And so it's for each one of these, I think it's a larger question of, do you even need a fine? And if so, should it be criminal? And if not, is there a logical person to issue the fine outside of a police officer? For wage theft, we said the logical person is, I think, the building inspector or the health department or something, because they might actually be in the building seeing the signs not posted. Here, I think the question would be, who's going to show up if someone is called, if the homeowner or the renter or the tenant who just had their door knocked is called, or you know the daughter or son of someone who just got scammed, they call, who's going to respond? I think those are the questions we need to be asking, and we need to be asking them all over our bylaws, not looking necessarily at each one, because we need, I think, press there. We need the police department there. We probably need our building commissioner there. He's sometimes some of the ones that we're like, oh, just give it to inspectional services. They might not want it either. <laughs> you know, and so I think, I think it's definitely a bigger question, but I would caution us from doing anything without speaking to the people who would most likely get or remove that enforcement from or be responding to complaints under these particular bylaws or any of the bylaws there's because there's so many different ones with waste waste hauling the complaint probably goes to the board of health so they might be the right like i think we have to think about where that phone call would go yeah, I, I very much agree with that. And I think what I'm thinking about is we're moving from a system that maybe is penalizes people to a system that tries to rehabilitate or educate people. I think we're trying to do that all over. And so um, if we want to do that, I think that the questions that Mandy is is raising are the right questions to think about, not necessarily just to take everyone and dump it on to Cress, um, but to really um, look at whether enforcement is needed, both criminal and non-criminal, and then who would be the appropriate places um, for that to happen. So if the committee is in agreement about doing such a review of all of the bylaws with that lens, <clears throat> is that something that we can that I can just add to the GOL uh, agenda for a discussion on how we might structure that and who we might, you know, invite to that conversation, or is that something that we take to Lynn and ask to have it be discussed at the council and referred back to GOL? How would you recommend? either anyone really, but Pat or Mandy, who's been here a little longer. I mean, I perfectly see it within GOL's capability to, and GOL's charge to do that type of review, um, a, a holistic review. If it was, we're looking at one specific one, maybe, but if we're doing a holistic review, I think that's within our governance charge, right? Um, mm -hmm. It is really about how are we going to govern and uh, so I, I would say if GOL wants to do it, GOL can do it without a formal referral. Um, but it might take some planning and looking as to which ones to look at and stuff. 
The other, I'm I'm having some noogly feeling that I can't quite articulate um, to what you're you're saying. I agree that the bylaws need to be looked at, and and but I there's something bothering me about. Well, we're trying to move away from the police and having that and. And what Crest purposes is, and and really, we're just going to be nice. I'm very, very badly paraphrasing what you said, Michelle. Very badly. Um, okay. I, th I think one I understand. of the things that in any interaction with a police officer or any kind, you know, with the traffic officer, they have discretion to in to um, give a ticket or not. And what feels more important to me is, as a white woman, am I not getting a ticket because I'm white, and somebody and Anika is getting a ticket because she's brown? It, it, that's that to me. I, I want us to really pay attention to, but I, I think I don't know, and I haven't got this fully articulated about what. That's as close as I can get right this second. Yeah, let me, Mandy, if you would just let me respond to that briefly. Um, so, I'm, no, I, I, my purpose is not in saying we're trying to move away from the police. My purpose is in saying that we as a community have decided to use a new lens to look at community safety. And so I feel that in order to do that, we need to look at the laws that govern our community. Yeah with that lens on and to really see where maybe some of what we have here is outdated or could be transitioned into something that um, honors that new lens. Yeah, and I don't have any trouble with how you're saying it now, but I have trouble with how you said it before, because I don't know if I want to just be nice. And, you know, I don't want to go, oh, well, you did it and you did it. I think that anybody who who engages in any kind of community safety person is contacted. That person needs discretion. So I think we can go too far. But I do agree that we need an equity lens to really look at everything that we're doing in this town. Uh, you know. Yeah. So. And, I'll and shut I think up. what I said was moving from a system. I think what maybe activated you is that I said moving from a system of penalizing to rehabilitating. And in my mind, that's not, that's harm reduction. That's not uh, at all being nice. It's, it's simply, I don't, I personally, and now I'm just injecting my personal beliefs into this, don't feel like we need to be penalizing um, nearly as much as we do, even for small things like this, where we can be educating somebody that's knocking on the door who, I mean, and, and I'm not going to- That's what I'm saying, that the- So, we, yeah, let's have an offline conversation about yeah, because, that. It, yeah, because- but, the point is really that I think that it's important for us now that we're using this new lens as a community, we've decided to do that. So let's look at the laws that govern the town and just uh, make sure that they're- I totally agree with that. Okay. And I see, Mandy, that your hand is up. Yeah. Um, I agree with both of you. <laughs> um, That's why we need a larger conversation. <laughs> no, we need a larger conversation because, you know- <laughs> I think, you know, we, and we also need to hear from the police as much as some people may not want to hear from the police or have us relying on what the police say they do. Pat gave us an instance where it could be a scam. Well, then maybe we want to add extra criminal fines in. But I think most times if someone called and said they don't have a license, someone would show up and say, hey, you need your license. Here's the application. Can you fill it out? <laughs> like, you know, um, and, and do it in that peaceable way um, to get compliance. But, but what I wanted to say is we need that larger conversation because for instance, and I don't know where Jennifer might've been thinking about this one, noise complaints. We've heard a lot of people say, and our town has moved away from writing tickets for noise complaints. Um, but we have heard in, G in CRC with all of the responses that there are residents that really feel we need to start writing more tickets for noise complaints because that nice approach as, as someone referred of, well, just disperse, 
doesn't always work um, for repeat offenders and everything, and that writing some tickets might actually be not necessarily the only thing that works, but the potentially for certain instances, the best approach. Um, and that's why I think it needs to be a comprehensive discussion and stuff and might still, even if we don't want police as writing a ticket, the first response, why we might still want to leave in the option for a criminal ticket or a non-criminal ticket, even if that's not the first response we want. Because if we take it out completely, there is no enforcement mechanism, no matter whether you violate that bylaw or not. If we take out these two criminal enforcements and non-criminal disposition, there's no way to tell someone, well, you have to have that registration because there's no way to enforce it with a ticket. And so then the bylaw maybe shouldn't even be there. Um, and so those are the conversations I think we need to have. Absolutely. Um, Anika. Uh, yes, so I, I also like Mandy, I, I feel what both Michelle and, and Pat are saying, and we're talking now about fines and who's issuing them and trickling on to, um, you know, actual interaction um, between either police and press and whomever. And I think that, you know, it would do us all uh, probably a, a service as, you know, we clearly all have questions, whether it's this group or a council um, as a whole, um, because I know, um, you know, I, I just don't want this to escalate where we're as, as passive, nicing people um, to an issue. You know, it, it starts one way, but I think that we have to be mindful of us who are not in law enforcement of how we are determining how press and police are interacting. I think all the, the questions are nice, but I know myself that if I'm in a situation and I'm threatened and you know, there's a police or a press officer in between myself and someone who's going to cause me physical harm, if that person is of color, I don't want whomever to be fearful of protecting me where they're so fearful they're stunned and frozen and unharmed or anyone else. So um, I think that, you know, we're, we're in a very, I think as I'm not sure if it was Paul, I think it may have been Paul, we're in a fragile time and I do not um, use that as a, an excuse for not acting. I think that, you know, it would be great if we actually, you know, move forward a little faster than we do with things. But I think that it is really important um, for us to be able to look at things uh, for both perspectives because you have great and horrible people of all ages, races, colors, and sizes. Um, I think that we're all aware of where you know people who are um, targeted more than others, discriminated more than others, you know, I certainly am. Um, but I, I do agree that we need a bit of a, a balance and um, mm -hmm. you know really can't be afraid to dive into um, you know asking just tough questions about where police and, and crest interact and how. Um, and that's about it. I think I'm I'm rambling on right now. It's just there's something resonating in this conversation that seems like that you know could lead to elephant in the room and i hope that that doesn't happen jennifer um yeah i was just i mean i agree with everything that's been said and also you know just you know i don't think when we say what well, we want to move away from police officers i mean i think that's the whole country's dealing with that you know the whole question of if should should you really have an officer needs to stop you because you switch lanes you know on a street without signaling you know that that's so i think that is a comfort that's happening really nationally that we use the police when we it's really not appropriate um but yeah the, the question and this is also for another time but when to call press and, and you know i think about that a lot in terms of noise um nuisance calls i you know, don't want to use Crest's time, you know, 
knocking on a door and asking that a party disperse. Because usually the, the police, my experience, they come, they'll say disperse, and they, it disperses. It's not, you know, because it's, there. these are at, you know, that there's usually not a problem. Um, so, and I worry of using Cress's time, you know, I don't want to impose on them when they have more important things to do. So I don't also know how we, I don't want to impose, I don't think the police should be imposed on either, but you know, that's just, because I have heard people say, oh, that's great, the, you know, Cress can be involved, you know, if there's a house party, but I don't know that Cress, sometimes I think maybe Cress has more important things to do. I don't know, so that's a whole, you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying they want to involve Cress and it's, you know, they're 11, whatever officers. So I think, I wonder if that's also a conversation, probably not for here, but you know, that, you know, what do we want to ask Cress to do so we're not pulling them too thin? I guess that's what I'm saying. Everybody wants Cress. Yeah, and I do think that that's a broader conversation that's gonna happen between the Cress department and Paul and the council and seeing what they actually are ending up responding to. Um, I don't think that that, I think that's different than, uh, you know, reviewing the bylaws, but agreed that that is a larger question that's going to be answered in time. Um, and it will be very interesting to see what they do end up responding to. Um, but keeping in mind that the incident that we spent most of our meeting on Monday talking about was a response to a noise complaint. Um, right. No, I know. And I, I was thinking about that a lot because it was a very different response than happens with college students. And I don't know if it's because they're not minors. No, I, I mean, I'm not but that is another conversation because I think the response was very different. We can discuss what the reasons might have been. Yeah, yeah. Mandy? I'm just going to try and get us back on track on our agenda, which is how to make a motion. To, yeah, please. Um, to, let, let me make it the right one. To um, recommend the council uh, adopt the revisions to general bylaw 3.36 soliciting and declare those revisions clear, consistent, and actionable. Second um, question though, Mandy, I just realized, so we don't have a note taker. Um, so Athena is going to, I believe, be taking our uh, minutes by recording. So just so everyone knows that it's just a comment. Um, so I second that. Any further discussion? Okay. All right. So we'll do a roll call vote, starting with you, Pat. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Anika. Aye. Mandy. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. So that is a pass. And thank you, Mandy. Um, if, well, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> I was going to come back to the KP law thing, but I guess that's just something that can happen as a separate uh, piece of, of this if needed. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk with Paul about that. All right, so let's see here. Um, let's move to the uh, discharging of firearms, since we already spoke about that once, and uh, we have some new information that's in the packet. It was an email from uh, an email exchange between me and Chief Livingstone, uh, and maybe we can just, I thought it was in here. Did everyone see that? Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, it it says forward general bylaw 3.36. For some reason, that's how the mail downloads when you download a, a mail comment. Um, and I can't open it in that type of file system. Oh, all right, let me see if I can open can it. Can you just share the, sure. I think it was bylaw review questions is the one you're looking for, Ray, bylaw review questions, but can you just share your screen with it on it? Yes. Okay. So, well, this is the message. Is this what you wanted me to share, Mandy, the, the correspondence? I'm not for soliciting. You need the other one right. from the. Oh, that was yours. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hang on. Let's see here. 
tab share. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, now I'll share again. Okay. So uh, when we talked about this last time, we had two questions. The first question related to whether an air gun and whether a paintball gun was considered as an air gun. Um, and then the second question was with respect to hunting and whether we should add uh, hunting into the second part of the bylaw. And so this is what Chief Livingstone had to say about both of those. So it looks like we can remove that first part of the bylaw based on this, unless we have, I don't know if that satisfies, it was your concern, I believe, Mandy. Um, and then you can see what he said about the hunting, that we don't need a separate bylaw, but that adding hunting into the, adding a line about hunting for clarification wouldn't would be okay. And if you just give me a thumbs up once you've had a chance to read this and then I'll ask Mandy to bring up the actual bylaw. Jennifer, I see that you're talking, but you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, my air conditioning on, it's a little loud. I, um, no, I'm just having trouble reading it because of its size. Let me see if I can, oop. Then we lose it, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, you probably you can't go bigger than that. Oh, you know what? I can make my screen bigger. Never mind. I just fixed it, I'm sorry. And just for anybody who may be watching this, who's having a hard time, uh, again, paintball guns do not fall under the classification of air guns. And then he says most, if not all, hunting guidelines fall under state laws and jurisdictions. Most of the enforcement falls under the environmental police. Um, and that we could add a line to record, we could add a line to recreational hunting for clarification um, in that second part of the bylaw. Everyone good with this if I stop this share? Okay. All right. And then we, Mandy, if you would bring up the bylaw, we can look at it. And again, Nika, Anika, if you have any questions, um, this was this was one of the bylaws that we decided to review at our last meeting, and uh, those were the questions that we had for Chief Livingstone to further clarify what changes we might want to make. So I think what we were proposing was to remove one altogether if um, the answer about the paintball guns was satisfactory um, and then to add recreational hunting as an H under number two. And that would allow people who engage in hunting, um, they wouldn't, it wouldn't, it would be an exemption from the bylaw or, yeah. Mandy, please. So I don't think I can agree with removing one, even if we add recreational hunting to number two. Um, so 12E, 269-12E, Mm -hmm. um, prohibits discharge of firearms within 500 feet of a building. So it allows discharge of firearms beyond 500 feet of a building. I'm trying to simplify things here. Um, so this bylaw, I believe, only restricts or deals with restricting shooting beyond 500 feet of a building. Mm -hmm. because 12e already prohibits within 500 feet of a building 
So we're talking about regulating the discharge of firearms outside of that 500 foot range because you can't be inconsistent with the law um, and you can always regulate, in general, you can regulate stricter than the law, but not less strict. Um, and so what number, what the exceptions do is allow you to actually shoot something outside of that 500 foot barrier. Um, and I can foresee of instances where shotguns would be logical to shoot outside of that 500 foot barrier um, that if we only add hunting into two might be too restrictive. You know, I, I just think a shotgun is much different than a handgun. Um, and two basically says only in these instances that we've said, can you discharge any firearm in that beyond 500 foot range? That's what to the way I read two is saying. Um, and if we eliminate one, that means only A to G is the only proper way to discharge, a, the only legal way to discharge a firearm beyond 500 feet of a building in Amherst. Um, and even if we add recreational hunting in, I just don't know whether that is enough. I know there's concern about firearms. I know there's always a lot of hatred and fear around firearms. I'm not myself, I've never shot one in my life despite having many opportunities to have done so. I've chosen not to. Um, but I think we're by by trying to eliminate one, we're potentially limiting, unduly limiting without knowing exactly what we would be prohibiting. And so I could not vote to eliminate one. Mandy, could I just ask you quickly to follow up? You said you could see an instance where a shotgun would be used other than hunting um, to go at a range further than 500 feet. Is there a particular instance I can't think of any, so I'm just wondering if you have an instance in mind. So I don't know what the definition of recreational hunting is, if that includes only the animals listed in state law. And there might be people that hunt animals not listed in state law. Um, I am not sure that C, 2C, um, allows a person to go out and target shoot for fun on their own property because of the language range established for these purposes. I don't know whether it has to be licensed under the state or not. Um, I have family in a different state that owns land that has set up a target practice shooting range on their land, but it's not licensed by the state, but it's perfectly safe. Um, I don't know whether C, I'm not knowledgeable enough about the laws to know or not know whether C would prohibit me from, if I had 10 acres of land, establishing my own target range on my property outside of that 500 feet or not. So I think we're trying to do something that might not actually, that we don't know enough about. Um, and I'm not, I, we haven't had problems with this bylaw. So what are we trying to fix if we haven't had problems with the bylaw, I guess is one of the things I would say. And we would be potentially fixing, quote, trying to fix something that we don't know is a problem. And we might be then creating more problems than we've actually fixed. Okay, I'm gonna pause us for a second because I notice that Pamela and Jennifer are here. Um, I asked them to come around this time. So um, I would like Jennifer and Anika to make their comments on this, but then I would like to pause us and we'll come back to this. Um, Anika. 
Okay, so my sorry, question, Jennifer, your hand went down and then up. I think you were but go ahead, Anika, and then Jennifer. <laughs> I just had a quick question. So the separation between and and you know, so I'm I'm not a gun person. I'm not as familiar with this, but the separation between shotguns and firearms are they separate? I'm just not as as sure. Like what what is the difference? It, would shotgun not be put in firearm? I'm just curious. Shotgun is a subset of firearm, just like air gun is a subset of firearm. So firearm is completely inclusive. Shotgun is only a subset. It fires shot. It doesn't fire a bullet. It fires shot. That was my question. I'll lower my hand. <laughs> Yeah. And that's what we were trying to clarify, um, you know, a little bit with the, whether the paint, I think actually the paintball gun was a clarification of air guns. Um, but like a, an example of a shotgun, um, I mean, yeah. I, so I think that there are some unanswered questions here. I think what you said, Mandy, about, um, target shooting on your own property, like game, game recreational shooting does happen, um, and can happen safely most likely. Um, but so let's pause on this one and we'll come back to it and let's invite our, it, our guests, if everyone's okay with that now. Um, so I think I have to just go ahead. I'm going to promote to the Good morning. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jen. Thank Thanks so much for joining Hello. us. Um, and sorry, we're a little bit later than what I had anticipated. Um, so, all right. Pat, thank you so much for sending that amazing information along about the equity lens review process in um, the... Whoop. How do you pronounce the name of that county, by the way? Oh, oh Noma. Okay. <laughs> Portland is. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we dig into that, and just so you know, Pat, I had, after our last meeting, you sent me a link and I provided that into the packet. Yeah, so I know hopefully, you yeah. okay, great. So hopefully people had a chance to look at that. And then Pat did send this morning some additional information, but I believe most of it was already in that yeah. link somewhere. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Very, uh, uh, it was very early when I reset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to quickly give us a framework for this discussion and really also allow, uh, or offer to Pamela and Jennifer what this is about. Um, so a little background, um, is that we very early on in our term as a GOL, talked about the possibility. I think I raised um, a, a proposal that we would go through as a committee and create an equity lens review process that we could use um, to review uh, bylaws, to review any sort of um, proclamations, resolutions, anything that comes through GOL. Uh, GOL is the committee that is tasked with reviewing any of those documents for clarity, consistency, and actionability. So we're sort of the last stop before something goes to the council for a final vote. And so we agreed that developing such a lens would be helpful and would fall within the purview of our committee. Um, and then at our last meeting, given that Pamela is now on board and um, working together Gen with Jennifer, um, that it would be appropriate to invite you all to come to um, participate in that process with us as much as you're able to. Um, and so before going in, into any more detail, I just wanted to see if Pamela or Jennifer have any questions about what we're trying to do here. No. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer. Okay. All right. So 
let's um so i wrote down a couple notes in preparation for this for this discussion um really to think about what we're trying to accomplish here so starting with thinking about what are our goals so what what are we trying to achieve by developing an equity lens review process um, and who does this affect um, so who and uh, and what really uh, bodies of work within the council's uh, jurisdiction does this affect and then who else other than the people in this room should be involved in um, contributing to the process and so that's sort of, um, and I really learned that, I think, working with Mandy on the rental registration bylaw, really developing goals as a first step. Um, but I don't think we have to, you know, go super deep into that, but maybe just hearing from everybody what, what the goals are in their mind um, for developing this and how it would be used. So if anybody would be willing to, to jump in on that. Um, and has anything to contribute to that, that would be great. Anika? So just for clarity, when you're, when you would, uh, sorry, I'm just um, coming back, back to this and, and seeing you know that we are talking about this today but when you're asking are you asking specifically right now in terms of who do we think should be in who else rather do we think should be involved with the process and how yeah. it's rolled out i'm sorry uh, yes, exactly. Like if there are any other people that we should um, be engaging with as we develop the process um, to get their feedback or to get their input um, at all, there may, it may just be that this group can develop the process and bring it to the council um, and, and that's it. But if there is anyone else, I was just thinking about who would those people be? Did that answer your question, Anika? It, it did answer my question. And so if I'm not going off track, if we're talking about this, like our, our bylaws, like how could we, who would we really, if you think about it, not involve that list could be endless, you know, as it does apply, I, I, would, I would say to anyone. And um, I was actually, I'm actually involved in a project that I was just, um, invited to participate, it's actually in regards to reimagining Black and Indigenous uh, history in New England. And one of the, the questions was this, you know, um, was people were, you know, telling stories and one of the, um, the tribes involved said, uh, had mentioned, but, you know, did you, did you ask us, you know? Um, and they, you know, had mentioned like, you know, and this, you know, really resonates. You you hadn't asked us to be involved, like you're talking about us in a sense, but you hadn't involved asked us to be part of, of the process. So my question with this is where is the balance? Um, where is the balance and, and do we have the capacity? And I could not be understanding this, but when I look and I see the volume of the bylaws, um, there's there are so many, and and as I agree, they have to be looked at. Like, how do we um, pace ourselves while being um, inclusive but also realistic to get through? Is there a timeline for this, or is this ongoing? So I think I have those questions before I could be a little more specific in my opinion. Yeah, I think those are great questions. Um, and I don't think we have, uh, this isn't ur like an urgent, I mean, it, it is urgent, but it's not an urgent matter. It's not even been referred to us. So we don't have any sort of timeline from the council. It's really however we want to work through our own work plan in developing this. So it may be that we don't complete it until December and recommend it in December. You know, it could take us that much time. Um, and I agree that uh, having the making sure, even if it's not in every meeting, but that we're having touch points with the people that we need to um, touch into and engage in this is really it's, it's a critical um, 
piece of the work, I think. Um, so this is really just like the first conversation that we're having to sort of lay the foundation. And it's not something that necessarily only applies to bylaws. I think this would apply really a lens to for every committee to be able to use, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a council committee or a town committee, um, to be able to ensure that that equity lens is on when they're doing their work. <clears throat> um, I see Pamela's hand is raised. Yeah, so I just had a, a couple of thoughts um, in uh, response to your question and also some information that I wanted to share. So I, um, Jen and I are in the process of uh, putting together a strategic plan for both our department and um, an assessment tool that would go out to the other departments in town. And as part of that assessment tool, we will be asking them um, to do uh, some work. I mean, we didn't want to overwhelm them with that a huge assessment tool that asks like hundreds of questions, but we will begin to, to inquire about the equity of the work that they do as far as the consist as far as their employees are concerned, as well as outcomes for residents. So I think that's just something for you to have in the back of your mind. And as we as you work together, um, know that we're also working on, on that issue. The um, the other uh, part and response is that I think that whom you need to call to be at the table with you is going to vary uh, by ordinance and by subject matter. Like it, I, 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 it's going to be an exhaustive list, but essentially you're going to have to connect with every department um, that's touched by each of the bylaws that you um, that you plan on reviewing because they're gonna have expertise that you may or may not have about the particularities of why the bylaws was written as it was written and what it aims to do. So I do think that this is gonna be an ongoing process. Um, I think you're ambitious to think that you might be able to do it by January, but you know. <laughs> um, I, so my suggestion would be maybe to think about prioritizing which bylaws do you think are the most important ones to tackle and um, and tackle, I'm just going to throw out a random number, like those 10 or dozen um, to begin with. And then as you're as you start to to go through um, looking at the equity lens, you will probably refine your tool a little bit. So creating an, uh, the tool or using the tool that uh, Pat has suggested will give you a good start and then you'll be able to be more specific as you as you go along. But um, it's certainly part of the work that Jen and I plan to do is to also ask departments to do that, which would require, I mean, one of the things that I'll go back and look today is to see if we asked specifically in our assessment tools about bylaws uh, I think we, I think we asked about departmental policies, but we could actually add that as a question to our assessment tool as well. Thank you, Pamela. Um, I saw Pat and then Mandy. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pamela. Um, I don't see us just working on bylaws, um, and and um, what I see us. Uh, or GOL looking at is bylaws, but also uh, looking at um, committee uh, charges, um, um, outreach, um, so, uh, committee selection, the whole selection process, um, and employment. I'm, I'm really glad you and Jen are working on that. And if you, so I guess I, I haven't seen this as focusing so narrowly on bylaws, but generally, I don't even know if this, if this town or this committee has a shared definition of equity and stuff. So I, I think, I, and I agree with you, Pamela, we're not gonna be done by January. Um, not if we're gonna do a really good job. <laughs> and I, I know from working with Mandy on different things, it can take quite a while and this affects uh, policy across the board. Um, so that's kind of just the beginning of what I have to say. 
Mandy. <clears throat> Before I ask my question, I'd love to hear what Jennifer wanted to add. Jennifer. Thank you. So I, you know, while Pamela and I are working on very parallel things to what you guys are working. So I would say that we should be working um, together a little bit more on that. Um, just because like boards and committees is something that we will be working on. It's included in the strategic plan and a new onboarding process to be developed so that the committee members who aren't aware of how town works are fully aware of how town works before they become, um, you know, maybe at their first meeting they learn a little bit more but that whole process so people aren't coming in so blind because it is a big adjustment coming from the public sector um and then um i'm a strong believer that if you guys are going to look at the committee charges that you make sure that you similar to what pamela was saying about the um bylaws is that you include the individuals and the committees in those charges because one thing that doesn't feel inclusive is when one group of people make a chart change to something that other people do and then there are all of these little things that you know the group that made the charge changes because they're not aware of how it actually plays out um didn't realize and it, it just calls for a much more inclusive process i think when you include every you know the committee that you're looking at reviewing the charge for. So very so much of what Pamela said. And thank you for that, Jennifer. And I just, I want to make sure that it's clear and, and then I'll go to you, Mandy. I just want to make sure that it's clear that we're not, we're, and, and I'm going to use this because on Monday it was used, the word rubric was, was, was used, um, I think, to describe uh, something, a tool, I think is what Pamela said, that we can use to look at all of these things through. So we're not going to necessarily be doing the review of every charge or of every anything. Um, we're just wanting to create a tool um, that can be used across the board um, to with equity at the center of it. Um, and it does sound like some of that work is already occurring um, in your department. So I, I would really like to hear more about that and whether we're duplicating an effort that has already started um, and whether we can be more of a supportive role or if we have a different role altogether. Um, so Mandy. That was a great segue into my question <laughs> um, because I, I think, yeah, I, I was thinking our discussion today starts, how do we go about having an equity lens to anything we do on the council? Um, and that's where I, I know I myself need a lot of help hopefully from the two of you in your department, but also from others, um, on what questions do we need to ask as we're reviewing X, Y, or Z, whether that's a bylaw, whether that's a streetlight policy, whether that's a waste hauling policy and change of systems, um, you know, and, you know, what questions do we need to ask? Are we equipped as a council or a subcommittee to ask all of those questions ourselves or are there recommendations for who we always need to bring in to help us with that review or go out and consult during that review? We know some of our committees consult with um, the Transportation Advisory Committee or the DAAC, the Disability Advisory and Access, Access and Advisory Committee for things that they are experts on that we are not as sort of counselors generalists. Um, but along with equity, I think, with Pat said, I think we need a shared definition of what that means, but I wonder if it could also include um, the climate side, or is that also, should we be looking at two separate ones? And I don't mean to distract from this conversation, but I know in our first council, there was a lot of push to always have climate as a climate lens, look at everything in a climate lens. And, and I would love to know how those two interact, even if we have to figure out what a climate lens questions are. How would your department advise us in, you know, yeah. meeting those two together? Um, because 
I, I personally don't have enough knowledge to know whether they will conflict very frequently or very infrequently um, and all. And so I'm hoping your department can help us navigate what questions we need to ask. Who do we need to involve when we're asking those questions? Is it appropriate for us as counselors to be asking those questions or are there other places that we should be seeking that expertise from and then a report from like we do with DAAC on anything related to streets, they come in and we say, tell us your thoughts on disability access on this. And then we get their report. Is that something we should be doing instead of doing that lens review ourselves going out to someone else? Those are some of the at least initial questions I have about creating this process that is extremely important to do. Um, so thanks. So, um, Oh, ahead, do you mind please. if I go ahead and jump? Please do, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think Jen and I will welcome working with you all on this issues. I mean, we are department of two, so we can <laughs> do everything that we would like to do. Uh, and Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the town has been a member of GARE for two years. And GARE is the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. Um, and they work with towns and municipalities in creating um, equity assessments and lenses and advice um, um, across the country. Most recently, they have been supported in their work by the Boston Fed to work with, uh, I believe, like six communities in the eastern part of the state. So I've been working to try to see if we might be able to establish a cohort in the western part of the state to work with GARE. We already have GARE membership. Um, I've reached out to the DEI director in the uh, city of Springfield and also in Pittsfield. And I think if we could find uh, one or two more municipalities to work with us, then there's a good chance that we might be able um, to be able to engage uh, them to assist the town in walk, working through um, all of the steps that we need to do. And I, I mean, the assessment tool that uh, I put together, I borrowed heavily from them. I can send you one of the tools that they use for the city of Austin. Uh, it's very, very comprehensive and it really envisions, a, you know, a long-term commitment to this work. Uh, but in the meantime, while we're you know, working to sort of see if we can get a GARE re, uh, coalition going on in the western part of this state. I've borrowed heavily from their tool to sort of start the process here. Uh, I think it's always going to be the case that we're going to need to seek some expertise from outside just simply because we don't have the manpower um, or all of the specialization to do this in internally. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. Yeah. It's really helpful. Yes, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I was going to say because we, you know, we just don't have the expertise ourselves. So it would be that would be very helpful, both not to I feel like reinvent the wheel and maybe reinvent the wheel not effectively. So. <laughs> uh, yes, Jennifer. Jennifer Moise. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when I was listening every time yeah. when you said Jennifer, I was like, what? <laughs> yep. um, so I just kind of wanted to get back to Mindy's point about the climate. And so um, I don't really know necessarily because I, I don't know that much about it of whether or not they need to be two separate lenses. It seems like you should be able to do them as one. But I know that climate is an equity issue, too. Right. So that they run very hands in hand. Um, so I, that's something to think about right there in whether or not you need two separate lenses because they run so parallel to each other. Yeah, they're very, very intersectional. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, the other point that I want to just make sure to put on the record here now is that I think the um, larger discussion about creating the equity. I'm sorry, Jennifer, are you, is your hand still up? 
Jenem, okay, um, is <laughs> um, to include the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee um, in this conversation. I think that if we're talking about a committee that uh, would potentially provide advisory to us, um, like you said, Mandy, with the Transportation Committee, for example, um, there might be a way that they, I don't know what their workload is or what they have. And Jennifer, you you would know because you're the staff lay. Are you or Pamela? Are you also the staff liaison to that committee? Okay, all right. So it seems natural that that they might also be um, a, a good committee for us to include in this discussion. Um, but oh, Pat, just one sec. I'm just going to say one more thing here. Okay. Um, this seems, um, at least from this initial discussion that we're having, like something that is going to take some time. It's going to need to include more people. Um, Pamela just mentioned some excellent resources that we might be able to tap into, which I'd really like to see if those can come to fruition. Um, I think that that would be really excellent. So just to the committee members, last time we talked, we talked about the possibility of when we review for clarity, consistency, and actionability. Also, whether we formalize this or not, when we're reviewing things in the meantime, while we're developing this process, if we can also be looking um, to make sure that we're reviewing things um, from an equity standpoint as well. And so I'll leave that there for a second. And then uh, Jennifer and then An Anika. Um, I just wanted to say, I believe that our GARE membership can hold about 100 people. So there's lots of room for, uh, you know, folks, members of this committee to jo to join our GARE. That would be great. That's great. Um, and that would happen through Brianna. Awesome. That's great. And also, Pat is a um uh the liaison to the community safety and social justice committee as well um just yeah, and also disability access and there are definitely people i mean they came up already they need to be included um because they're they are consistently overlooked no matter how much we try to engage guilford and other people in, in listening and hearing what their concerns are so um yeah yeah Anika, um, your hand was up. Oh, sorry, I, I was distracted trying to find how do I change my hand. I don't know what happened. Um, so I, I'm not sure if this would work here. I know that the, the Jones Library Building Committee uses a program that actually um, uh, Brianna um, recommended, which allows, and, and I'm not sure if this would work with bylaws, would allow for um, the bylaw and the breakdown to be listed and then also has um, comment section, room for review and suggestions. And I'm, I'm not sure for sake of, of time when inviting others to participate or even when seeking input from other committees, if that's something that could be used. Um, because it would allow people, you know, in their own time, especially if, you know, whether it's departments that, you know, people are, are working and they're seeing, um, you know, just what stands, whether it includes, whether it's just um, seeking information um, and input. I'm wondering if that is something for time and also to be able to reach a broader range of people and be more convenient would be something to be utilized. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's readily like available that can be that we could look at? Um, not in this moment, but just in yeah, general. Yes. yeah. Okay. Okay, that would be great. So maybe for our next meeting, we can have that included in the packet so that and any information about GAR as well would be really helpful if you could send that would be excellent. Um, that's great. Um, so how I feel like a little bit more thought needs to go into, based on this initial conversation, a workflow and a process that doesn't duplicate efforts that actually um, where we can work together and have a work plan um, that 
gives us specific uh, goals to achieve each time we bring ourselves back together to discuss this. Um, if does anyone else have any other thoughts on that? Because between now and the next meeting, I could certainly work um, with Pamela and Jennifer, if that's helpful to just sort of establish a timeline for how we might work through um, a plan for this. Does that work for everyone? Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, great. Um, so thank you, Pamela and Jennifer, mm -hmm. for joining us. And oh, I yes, Pat, please. One of the things that, uh, and I really want to hear from Jennifer and Pamela, uh, community conversations, you know, are, are a big, broad term. But it seems to me, after experiencing Monday, <laughs> again, where people can be right on both sides and wrong on both sides, we can be right but wrong. Um, and so it seems to me that I, when I'm thinking right now, community conversations, I'm thinking about uh, a full uh, gamut of the BIPOC community. But I'm also thinking of, as a lesbian, I and, and I was thinking about Evan, who was a counselor who's gay. I would love for us to be able to have conversations with lesbian and gay trans people here in Amherst to talk, just like we're looking at disability access. So what are some of the other groups that we really need to look at? Uh, and how do we do that? And what, and I don't know, I may be wasting everybody's time right now, but it, it does seem to me that if this committee could figure out some generalized questions that that would relate to almost any community we could even divide ourselves up with two of us going to you know different groups and meeting and I, I guess I would love to hear from Pamela and Jen about whether that's a, a potentially good idea that can be implemented or is it just kooky and almost not possible to implement <laughs> so I, Pamela and Jennifer, take it away. So, all right. I was going to allow Jen to go first, but I, um, Jen, please feel free to jump in. So, yesterday, uh, Jen and I were having this very same conversation. As part of the strategic plan, we included um, community engagement, which is a large char part of the charge for the department as a whole. And there are several different models for how one might engage in. Um, in these types of conversations. So here uh, among the five colleges, we have experts in intergroup dialogue. Intergroup dialogue is a deep dive into a particular subject matter. It's been used at all of the five colleges, Amherst, Hampshire, Smith, Mount Holyoke, and UMass. And there are uh, UMass faculty members who um, created this model for having the conversation. So um, that's one that would be a, a natural, sort of easy to tap in because there are already experts in the area um, to, to engage or lead conversations for intergroup dialogue. Intergroup dialogue is designed to be generally, I would say like a six week commitment. So you're committing to having the discussion over the long, over the, a long a period of time. So, so that's one model. Uh, the city of Boston for many, many years engaged in um, what they called uh, difficult uh, dialogues, which was a series of conversations that took place around the city uh, on specific topics. And they were sort of short term, like you showed up one night, you talked about um, about a topic and then, you know, you may not see the group of people for um you know, for weeks or months, or you may not engage again. They're really sort of designed to be one, st um, sort of one time um, conversations. There's another model that is used in the Commonwealth, uh, primarily by the state colleges and community colleges called NCBI. NCBI stands for the National Coalition Building Institute. They are based in Washington, DC. Um, and there are some members of the community college community in Western Mass who are trained as NCBI facilitators. I'm actually trained as an NCBI facilitator. That too is designed to be um, 
sort of a one day event, but it's a longer commitment. It's generally a half day or a full day of having conversations. So where our difficult dialogues, the Boston model might've been two hours, NCBI we would say would definitely be a half day, preferably a full day of engaging people around conversations. Um, and then there are many other models um, that we could use as well. And we begun to have conversations with um, the chamber and the League of Women Voters about uh, partnering around conversations. So my sort of vision for the conversations for the community is that um, what I said to Jennifer yesterday is I think they should be thematic in that there should be topics that we would cover over the course of a longer period of time. So naturally race um, might be one, but there might be others because the, the the goal is to really have people engage in conversations, not only about race, but about other topics where there might be some disagreement so that you start to be um, to build community. Uh, um, Paul has committed to following up on the CSSJC working groups recommendation for having, I believe it's Dr. Love, do some racial healing workshops. So that's something, he's on vacation this week, but that's something that we will follow up with when he returns. Um, so the answer is, uh, it is not a crazy idea. It's something that Jen and I have been discussing and um, it's a matter of just gearing up. You know, as I, as I said before, I don't wanna use this as an excuse, but we're an office of two and I've just been on the job for about six weeks. So it just, takes a little bit of time to build momentum to, to, to get these um, programs in place and to think about how, you know, we're gonna be able to carry them out. Can I interrupt? If we're gonna be working on this as a committee, and I, I believe we are committed to that, how can we help you to, in a sense, our bodies become available to you to do some of the work that you need to do? So we're thinking about how you can help us but how can we literally um, help you because you are a department of two? Uh, so, so I think that the call will be, I mean, NCBI has a train the trainer model and some of the other programs do as well so that um, we can you know, multiply our skills by having uh, people engage in some um, train and trainers uh, models for NCBI or whatever programs that we decide to use. So it's not simply Jen and I who are facilitating the workshops. And so that gives, you know, they're just simply, we need to grow our capacity. Um, I, I would say that my personal belief around facilitation is that it's always done in pairs. Uh, generally, I've always uh, um, done it with someone who doesn't um, have the same identity that I bring to the table. So there is some diversity among the facilitators. And, uh, and so I think the first step for us is going to be as a department deciding which of the programs, program or programs we wanna use and then trying to grow uh, our team of facilitators so that we're able to, um, to get started. And we may find ourselves initially needing to contract out for consultants to, to start while we build capacity, but we, you know, we just haven't, have not um, answered that question yet. And Jen, please, please, you know, jump in. Uh, Jen, Jen, Jen M. Jen, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then me. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say to follow up with um, Pat is that I, not that I think we need another set of acronyms, but you know, we do need an LGBTQA plus committee. Like we just, we don't have one. And lots of the other surrounding communities do. And I just think it's something that needs to be incorporated and that we should move forward with creating yet another set of acronyms for our mind. God, that one would be so long. The LGBTQ plus or and I'm committee. No, we'll have to make something easier. I'd love to work on that with you. Yeah, that sounds like a good because I not to say like 
this isn't on our agenda, but I think we're moving a little bit off of our agenda item. Um, and but I I love that idea of of um, <clears throat> creating that. And and Pat, thank you for bringing that up. And Jennifer, um, Pamela, did you want to respond to that? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, and Tom, yes, Jennifer. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say I'm in awe of how much you've done in you know in the few weeks we this depart you know you've been here um so it's uh so I just want to express an appreciation I know Jennifer has been amazing holding down you know being the department of one but uh you really you know you Who together, together okay. have just jumped right in and I you know so no apologies for being a department of two you have done so much in a few weeks it's amazing so thank you. There's nothing to do but jump foot feet in first <laughs> when it comes to the town of Amherst. I mean, it's like do it or big or just, you know, go home. Right. So, <laughs> well, you did get hit with a tornado. That was, I guess I want to check in that you're okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I am okay. I mean, I actually think Monday went better than I expected. My expectations were um, where things would be um, more difficult than that. And we have a meeting uh, coming up with the uh, CSSJ uh, next week. I think that will be a difficult conversation as well. But, um, you know, I, I am just trying to do my very best for the town as a whole and you know and that means that sometimes the conversations are going to be very difficult so um it, for me the most important thing is uh integrity and so i'm just trying to really model uh that in both my behavior and in my actions and so yeah we went out for lunch yesterday and <laughs> and treated ourselves so yeah we're, we're doing okay Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again for taking time to be with us today. And I will follow up soon so that we can um, establish a time to talk more about a work plan for the committee. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just checking. We do not have any attendees. So no, I, I call, so I called for public comment. Okay. <laughs> if anyone comes late, they missed it. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, all right. So let's, well, first just, um, let me transition a lot quickly here. So any other comments about this piece of our agenda before we go back to discharging a fire? <laughs> no, I'm, it's terrific we had it because they, it's good to know what they're already doing. So we know we don't have to start and, and you know, and that, you know, those with greater expertise than we are have already, you know, that they can really help guide us and we can coordinate with them. So it does seem important though, that we continue a conversation even to amongst ourselves, because, you know, Michelle, you were saying, we need to apply this immediately when well, we do, but mm -hmm. what is it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if the five of us could come to some agreement about how we might look at the next uh, thing that's submitted to GOL or what, you know, it's, so I don't know, I, I see it as a real parallel process and, and I'm grateful that we have them to rest on, to use, to, to learn from, to collaborate with. Um, I also think long-term, we need to be able to include the Human Rights Commission in this, in dialogue with us, et cetera. I, I just, I wanna just build a little bit on what you're saying, Pat, because I feel like, and maybe this is just true in municipal government, but I feel that there's a bit of a tension um, sometimes between what the staff is doing or within the purview of the staff to do and what the town council or committees are doing. And um, when I heard that they were already, I can imagine from their perspective, if they're already working on something and then they hear a committee who really in some ways has more power 
um, you know, is working on something, how that might feel. And yet don't want to just go to the other extreme of saying, well, let's just stop our work and let them do it. And we'll support them completely because I think there is a distinction between what we're doing and what they're doing. And yet think that there's a bridge for us to work together. So if anybody has any more clarity in that, yes, Anika. Well, I just have a, a comment and this, you know, this doesn't apply to everyone in town, but I think that, you know, uh, for a lot of people, um, having a DEI department is new. Um, you know, they're, they're not used to this. And then you have some of us where it's commonplace, you know, but that doesn't exempt one from looking at whatever you're doing through an equity lens, you know, um, so that wouldn't mean that, okay, you know, I mean, and, and just being aware that there are places where having a DEI department as, is a norm. And so there is always maybe going to be some um, cross references and, and oh, and but being mindful of overlaps because overlaps can actually slow things down. Um, and I'm not sure if the program and I wish it I wish it was on the tip of it, I just can't remember the name of it, but it's used by the Jones Library and I'm not sure this could be touchy, but maybe and I'm not saying this to put more work on. Um, the DEI department, but perhaps this is something that maybe they have access to um, and, you know, committees do. So there's maybe a some sort of communication or ongoing communication with um, like initiatives, you know, so it's clear, is this going on? Is there a way to support this? Is this something that maybe, you know, we or someone else could take off the hands of a different department and do some work? Um, but I, I think that, you know, there's that that balance, you know, some people it's like it's 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 a brand new thing, DI. You have a lot of people who have, because there hasn't been this department, that this work is people are trying to um, push it in and include it. And I, you know, I, I think again a point of having a department normalizing that, but also normalizing that, you know, I think the way we move towards doing what we're trying to accomplish is not make it an option. You know, just looking at things through this lens, period. You know, and if there's a question, um, you know, reach out and ask because we have tools, whether it's, you know, each other, DI department, um, we're not all going to have the answers, but I think that's how we'll move closer to it and not overlap and actually probably see some action happen sooner than later. Yeah, and I, I, again, I'm coming back to um, Anika, the last meeting I had proposed the possibility of adding equity to our review of clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, and I'm not getting the sense that there's a lot of support for that right now, um, but in making it a formalized sort of um, uh, way of looking at things, but even just like as we go back to this firearms bylaw or as we go on to any of the other bylaws that we're reviewing, I don't see any reason that we should not have a few minutes where we really discuss whether what we're looking at is um, being seen through an equity lens. Um, and so whether or not the group wants to formally request that GOL adds equity as the, it, it's like, we look at clarity, consistency, actionability. Why aren't we looking at equity? I don't understand why that's not uh, added. Yes, Pat. I, mean, I agree with that, but I, I disagree with your saying there isn't support for looking at things with equity in the group. Whether or not we change and whether we add that word, I just don't like the idea of adding a word that I don't even know what we all mean. What, what do we even just the five of us mean? I think we're damn close. I don't think it would be problematic. But before I add a word, I, wanted, I want us to have that discussion. And uh, it, it's... If we t take the the uh, firearms thing, how would an equity lens change the, the discussion that we had, or how would it? 
how would it have impacted the discussion today with firearms? Uh, and I, and I don't know, maybe that might not be the right question, but okay. it, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm just gonna say, I feel like I'm in a, an incredible amount of pain since Monday. Mm. The BIPOC community is no different than other, any other community, but the splits are painful and there were attacks that were totally unnecessary. And that mean, and, and I'm really grateful to Chalonet for bringing that up, for other people to bring that up. And I know that that same kind of rift exists around um, CR, in CRC and TSO and who likes what neighborhood and all this other shit. So, you know, to me, when we're looking at equity, I want to know what the five of us mean. And then if, if we can come to a shared understanding of that word, bringing it forward to a council, but to say there's not support for it doesn't feel right, Michelle. It, um, I, Pat, I feel like you're misunderstanding me a lot today, and I, I'm sorry for that. So what I'm saying is I've asked us to consider adding that um, as a sort of interim step as we're developing this process formally to ask right. that that be included in our charge, which is a change. And so I, that's what I'm saying I'm not hearing a lot of support for. I haven't heard anybody say, let's, yeah, let's do that. You know what I'm saying? So not to say I don't think the committee is supporting looking at things through an equity lens at all, just to formally change the charge to include that. And I agree a shared definition is very important. Um, but I also think that a lot of times it's just about putting the awareness on, putting the awareness on when we're looking through the thing, uh, we're looking at the thing, you know, um, and we, it's not natural. I don't think it's natural to look at things um, to your point about looking at other, you know, there's, there's racism, there's class, that is uh, an issue. Um, there's gender. So there are a lot of other things beyond um, racial equity or inequity that we're wanting to look at. And so uh, I guess maybe if I could be more direct, I'm asking for support in adding that as uh, a criteria of our reviews um, to formally change that in our charge. And if there are steps that we need to take to get there, um, such as uh, defining equity and like we defined clarity, consistency, and actionability, um, I'm fine with doing that. I'm just asking for more directly from the committee support in, in adding that as one of our criteria for review. You have my support. <laughs> <laughs> conversation and <laughs> okay thank you jennifer and then mandy yeah but i think that does get back to what <clears throat> you know pat was saying is i do think we support that but we have to have some kind of definition of what that is and i think if we went to the council and said we wanted to formally because we would have to do that right we'd have to get council approval to add the charge you know what Sorry. yeah what we mean because like pat said that can mean you know even if it's only slightly different things i think i guess this is what's hard for me that this committee it's very definable when we say clear you know concise and actionable but then you know with an equity lens again that's what can mean different things to different people so we have to be we have to at least have some depth you know definition of what that means i think before the council would approve that as part of our official charge absolutely yeah so we would bring a recommendation forward that would include changing the charge to add that as one of our criteria with a definition attached um that we would have no shot otherwise <laughs> uh, mandy I just want to be clear before I make my comments that I support our council reviewing things under an equity lens, just like I support the council reviewing things under a climate lens. 
um, I would be concerned about changing our particular charge as it relates to the clear, consistent, and actionable language to add to that language an equity lens, unless, and this is, this is where it gets complicated, um, unless we are allowed to do substantive reviews, which might become a little more um, complicated in looking at charges. And I say that because we've run into this problem with clarity, consistency, and particularly actionability, where our vote has been, well, it's not actionable or it's just not consistent. But we don't have the authority under our charge to change the language to make it consistent if that language change is deemed substantive. Um, and I'm having, I'm struggling with what an equity review would be. Would we really just say, well, it's not, it doesn't pass our equity lens review and leave it at that and send it to the council that way? Um, or would we have to say, here's the changes that need to be done to pass an equity lens review, but you know, we can't do that. And we can't talk about that, that needs to go back to another committee. And so I guess my biggest concern is not that it get done, it's what can we do when it gets done? Because I don't wanna send something back to a council for a first reading that GOL has voted, well, it doesn't pass the equity lens review. Um, so send it back somewhere else, which I guess is what I brought up the last time of, I think that that's why I think we want to create a process because I think the committees doing the substantive review are better suited to do that review because they're the ones under our charges. And it's really a constraint of charges in my mind um, that have the ability to accomplish the changes that need to be done if during that review you say, you know, this is actually not equitable. It's going to affect X, Y, Z inequitably. And so we need to change the substance to make it more equitable, but GOL is not charged with doing that. And it, I hesitate to open up that bigger conversation because I know Pat knows from prior years that I, I would love to see GOL be able to do substantive reviews. I think we might need a different committee structure though. So I just struggle with it. Hey, Nika. Go yeah. ahead. Go yeah. ahead. No, 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 no. Um, I was just going to say, and we may have raised our hands to this. We were being sworn in. Um, and where I support it, I also feel like none of us would have any business being here if we're not looking through this lens, you know, in general, in any committee. Um, and there might be ways that, you know, that's different. There might be ways that, you know, maybe my definition is slightly different from someone else, or maybe it is vastly different. Um, but it just, it brings up, and I'm, and I'm generally asking the question because I don't know if, you know, maybe is this something that, and not to take it away from here, but just a commitment in general that as a counselor we're coming in with. Um, to just use regardless where it, it applies because, um, you know, we're talking about firearms. I, I do not have a lot of experience with firearms, but if we're looking at this vial of firearms and we're saying like, we need to be fair and impartial, we might have uncomfortable conversations. So where I could say, you know, shotgun, what, what, you know, who needs it or whatever, we need to also look at those as Mandy pointed out that are, you know, in, in fair range, like do, I'm just wondering like how, how do we get past, you know, of some of these things, do we just, you know, have to be flexible in some accounts, leave it up to um, council to approve. But I, I could see it getting sticky, especially like for instance, with um, firearms. I think when we're talking about, you know, people, some of the, the proclamations that's, you know, more streamlined, but I could see it getting a little, you know, that, that, that's about it. I'm just getting stuck on that. Maybe I'm, my mind is just going back to the shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> we applied an equity lens to the shot. I'm just going to talk, Michelle. I'm sorry. Oh, no, please. I feel like Mandy Joe bringing up 
what she brought up made us look differently. So I'm, I, I, so I think we applied an equity lens. When we're talking about um, street numbers, um, originally on bylaw, there was concern about the fire department being able to find places. That was what was driving the look at the thing. But if you read the notes, one of the things it says is it has to be in numbers, not Roman numerals, not you know fancy script. It, it, so the equity lens there, and I'm, I'm using, I think, a pretty benign um, topic. It has to be visible to someone who has uh, sight impairments as much as possible. It needs to be in the language of that generally most people speak. So, I, you know, if I want to, I can add 20, I can make 21 in other languages, but that two one is going to help the fire department. It's going to help you find me. And putting XXI might confuse everything. So there's an equity lens. It, and, and in that instance, the using numbers, um, <laughs> My mathematician is going crazy because there's so many definitions of numbers. Um, but we're saying that um, it needs to be visible and available to everybody who's walking down the street. And, and so, so I think that we already, that that's why I want us to have a conversation. What are the places? And maybe one way to do it is when we go look at, at the next bylaw, whatever, we start talking about, you know, where Mandy brought that up on her, you know, not even thinking necessarily, well, uh, about, about putting the equity lens title on it. But of us really saying those things, those aren't substantive changes. When we have people here with proclamations and resolutions, they're here. And I will go back to a time when, when several counselors came together to do something around child abuse. And it was really written poorly. And if I had shut up, we would have maybe passed a resolution because the changes that I suggested were substantive and not just grammatical. But what I said is, do you wanna hear this? It's up to you as sponsors. It's always up to the people who are sponsoring the resolution or proclamation or the bylaw to decide but I, whether or not they're going to use something that comes up in a GOL meeting. But if, the, if it all starts to become substantive, we're off, we're off base. And it really might be that maybe we need more collaboration. If TSO comes up with something and we see necessary what the five of us think of as a necessary substantive change, then let's go back to the committee, not before we make a recommendation to the council and say, hey, here's what we're finding. What do you think? And we don't do that. There isn't this sense of, of we're working together. It's these little silos um, of people doing things, and then we're supposed to somehow or other magically know whether it's clear, consistent, and actionable. And I've gone on too long, so. Okay, well, it's 10.55, and I think we've had a really great meeting and a lot of really great conversation. Um, I do not think we're gonna go back to firearms right now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um, that leads me to just do a quick review um, of our next meeting's agenda to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, so at the next meeting, uh, let me just see here. All right. So we did not get to street numbering of houses. I think that will be fairly straightforward. Um, snow and ice. Guilford replied. I wasn't able to get that into the packet yet, but I will ask Athena to include it in the packet for our next meeting. So just to briefly answer, I think it was Jennifer's question about whether there was a list. Um, there is a list and it was provided in Guilford's email. So um, I'll send that all to you by email and also include it in the packet. We'll come back to discharging of firearms and then uh, 
we had a referral from the town council uh, with respect to the rubric um, and, and the, the matrix for um, making decisions on appointing people to committees. Um, Mandy, was that you? Did you bring that forward? <clears throat> so CRC brought forward all three um, referrals. There's three regarding the policy. Um, I don't know whether they had dates in them or not, but um, my my the rubric was originally my request. Um, Anna Devlin Gauthier, I think, is the one that actually brought it to GOL before she was even a counselor. Um, she corrected me on that from Monday night. Um, and But what I was gonna say with, res with respect to them is I'm not sure any, CRC has the changes at this point that I think it needs to conduct a better process in the upcoming vacancies because um, they asked for the waivers such that I think our timing for those three referrals is not as imminent as it might be in the thought of. Because um, if we can get these done, the next time the council really enters this process is next March. Um, and so I, I would personally, I think maybe we need to be aiming for like February, not a month on those things, given our the rest of GOL's items. Don't forget about it, but look at when do we really need to be done with these? And that's probably February. Okay. So they don't need to be on the agenda for next week is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm going even the week the after. Time. I guess that's that's my point is yeah. <laughs> PRC asked for the waivers from the policy. It really yeah. needs um for the upcoming group and so okay okay Let's go to minutes so we can get that done because i really have yes. a hard time. yeah 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 that's a great idea okay um so uh i move to adopt the august 3rd 2022 minutes or is there a second 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 pat can have it <laughs> pat's got it nika can have it <laughs> okay um, let's do a roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Aye. Anika? Aye. Pat? Aye. I'm an aye. Mandy? Aye. Aye. Okay, those pass. All right. So we'll have all of those agenda items that we talked about the bylaws. Do we, if, if I, that's going to take us some time. And then if we include another discussion about the equity lens, I'm going to think about that a little between now and when I have to create the agenda, talk to Pamela and Jennifer again. Um, I might throw in another bylaw for review if it seems like we're not going to have, like we're going to have some extra time. Um, but other than that, if there aren't any other comments, comments or questions or concerns, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 11 a.m. Oh, thank oh, you very much. Andy. Can I say one thing? <laughs> of course. Um, could you look at the um, proclamation and whatever calendar? Yes. For the regular ones that occur, we're going into September. We should probably be doing the October one soon. Oh, there's, yes. I don't know whether there's any. So let's <laughs> look it up. <laughs> I, I will look it up. And I was going to talk to you, Nick, because there's Indigenous people's um in October I don't know what's been done previously for that but yes I will I'm on it I was actually uh just spent um a good half of the day with um one of the uh Nipmuc chiefs yesterday um and touched on this so I would like to Great. share Great. some of that soon Great. okay why don't we just I'm going to add that for next week so yeah we can talk about that two weeks or next week uh two weeks sorry <laughs> next meeting two mm. weeks <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a good you. night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.